Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute in today's uh, forum, Whiplash, the Affordable Care Act's Twisted Path Through Implementation, Litigation, and Reinterpretation. I'm Tom Miller of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, we were last here on this topic in December of 2016, looking at the uh, unexplored frontier of uh, legal implementation of the Affordable Care Act with the incoming uh, Trump administration. Now we've had uh, about 18 further months of experience under uh, perhaps a, uh, a different look at how uh, the ACA uh, might be carried out. Um, in some way, the... Uh, the voters in uh, 2016 adopted one of the Seinfeld op uh, episodes uh, featuring George Costanza as the opposite, uh, saying that every decision they'd made in their life was wrong, so they would just do the opposite of what they did before, and suddenly things started working out a lot differently. Um, the, perhaps the better way to describe the uh, Trump administration's approach to implementation interpretation of the ACA as well as other things, is uh, thinking of the movie from uh, 2015, Our Brand is Crisis. Uh, we certainly saw that over the weekend uh, with some changes in how risk adjustment is being interpreted for the moment. Um, the, I'll provide a quick thematic overview of how far we have traveled since the heady days of 2009, uh, how the statutory text as uh, grudgingly enacted uh, by Congress by any means necessary, changed into something else uh, through the forces of litigation, um, administrative rulemaking, and uh, reinterpretive uh, enforcement uh, with only a limited amount of uh, legislative changes along the way. Um, let's, uh, as we track this uh, progression, of uh, health policy under the ACA through its conception, gestation, delivery, adaptation, and mutation. Uh, we'll start off with, uh, it was not exactly the uh, school book uh, approach uh, of uh, Schoolhouse Rock as to how a bill becomes a law, uh, just a, a bill, on a lonely bill on Capitol Hill. Uh, aside from the difficulties of actually taking what were the concepts of the ACA and putting them into uh, legislation under uh, difficult uh, vote counts and procedural odds, uh, there were a few detours and shortcuts along the way to get it out by whatever means were necessary. Um, and then at that point, it was a matter of finding out what was actually in it. Uh, I've likened the ACA to Forrest Gump's statement that uh, finding out what the ACA is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get until you look inside and open it up. Uh, there were many complex, uh, ambiguous uh, terms not always consistent with each other. Others were left to agency discretion uh, to fill in the blanks. Uh, and uh, the administration at that time, uh, due to the political calculations, was uh, perhaps unable or unwilling to go back to Congress for both technical and other substantive changes. Uh, so they would try to uh, solve, ameliorate, or bypass some of those problems through other uh, interpretive uh, recreations, if not uh, administrative improvisations. At times, it was a little bit like a uh, Transformer movie, where what you thought you saw turned out to be a little bit different as the Decepticons were well at work in uh, transforming. Perhaps most notably, in uh, the Supreme Court case in 2012, NFIB Sebelius, a tax penalty, whatever you want to have it, uh, in order to get the individual mandate uh, through by what means were necessary, uh, creating a new uh, auxiliary arm of the Medicaid program as a voluntary option, despite the way the statute was written, and exchange established by a state included. This change is not established by a state, but by the federal government. So this set off a, a wave of uh, lawsuits. Uh, you might think of this in somewhat in the uh, Prussian military sense of the 19th century. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz on, on war said that war is a continuation of politics by other means, and uh, the ACA litigation was a continuation of political warfare by other means, uh, not merely a political act, but uh, a real political instrument. Uh, now, with the election of uh, 2016, we had a different conductor of uh, all this jazz, uh, and it turned out that uh, under uh, President Trump, it was not quite his tempo. Uh, so we had a bit of a whiplash in terms of uh, what had been uh, assumed uh, before. Uh, but if you had the, uh, if you had Obamacare uh, as your number one pick in the Deadpool, it turned out that uh, you guessed wrong because it turned out that it was hard to kill. It takes a lot of effort to work a Steven Seagal movie into this, but I managed to do that. I don't see those many often anymore. Now, some people said after we went through the difficulties of Congress not being able to pass anything, despite Republican Congress, at least nominally, in the White House, couldn't agree on a replacement, that it was time to uh, just let it go. 
Uh, but it turned out that uh, we seem to be a little bit more frozen in terms of our relative battle lines than might have been the case. Now, thinking back to uh, the continuing battles here, one might think of the uh, slogan of the 1973 uh, pennant race before it really heated up for the New York Mets, Yogi Berra saying it ain't over till it's over, uh, but it turns out that what we've actually produced is more of the equivalent of the Infinity War. Uh, that's the, uh, the quick opening monologue. Uh, now let's try to get a little bit of the older history uh, out of the uh, way first before we go to our panel uh, to focus more on where we are currently uh, and uh, might be heading, uh, also why we are here and uh, what this says about health policy making uh, and politics and how our three branches of government sometimes work or do not work. Uh, I'd originally assigned this task uh, to Scott Harrington of uh, the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, uh, an AEI adjunct scholar. Scott is uh, temporarily on uh, the uh, disabled list, just a 10-day DL. It's a late scratch. Uh, so I'm taking basically his PowerPoint to just kind of clear our throats and get this hairball out of the way before we talk about kind of some interpretive approaches from the various panelists. So we'll start with uh, that right now. Uh, this is kind of a quick summary of the baskets of issues as to how much we've evolved since 2010. Uh, the general categories, we'll discuss this again in follow-up, is the various forms of mandates, uh, individual mandate, employer mandate, benefit mandates, which somewhat blurs into the uh, insurance rating and essential benefits, all these things put into play first through somewhat, uh, let's say, ambiguous or sometimes uncertain uh, statutory text, but a lot of in administrative rulemaking, other types of guidance, and then litigation to enhance that further. And we also had a lot of litigation more so over stabilization and subsidies, uh, the Medicaid expansion, which is now taking on more of the role of uh, how we'll wave around it. Uh, in other ways in Medicaid, uh, what were once the original uh, stated uh, goalposts for cost and premium containment provisions on that front, and other items along the way that seemed like a good idea at the time but didn't turn out to work out. So just a little bit more of a quick background on this very cursory. I'll leave out a lot of details because we can't really do this exhaustively. Uh, but uh, Real quickly, uh, remember the uh, fond uh, individual mandate, which was supposed to be a centerpiece of the ACA. Uh, it went through its own uh, ups and downs in the uh, 2012 Supreme Court case. Obviously, some changes in terms of IRS enforcement, tending to lighten the load and provide exceptions for it. Uh, a lot of either non-compliance or ways around it, where millions of people also were paying the penalty rather than buying the prescribed uh, Insurance, so it was a lot less effective in practice than it was originally proposed to be. And then, of course, we have the uh, tax legislation through reconciliation in December 2017, which in effect zeroed it out for 2019 going forward by making the penalty zero, even though the nominal mandate is a rhetorical urge without a lot of enforcement teeth still remains. And we'll return to this a little bit later on. The employer mandate. Uh, to offer uh, affordable coverage. Uh, that statute got a little bit delayed. Uh, first, it was a blog post, which delayed it in the summer of uh, 2013. Then some changes to how it was going to roll out uh, later on in 2014 uh, with different tiers that weren't there in the original statute. So in addition to the delays, different uh, uh, tiers of employers as to what applied. Now, it was kind of also they didn't print up the forms for a while and didn't actually enforce it, but it looks like now they're enforcing it for 2016, and some employers have actually been hit with some potentially sizable penalties, a little bit of a disproportionate nature as to how the uh, fine works, uh, even under the Eighth Amendment. Uh, but in any case, uh, there may be some efforts for at least some symptomatic relief, if not an outright challenge to it. Now, on to the uh, insurance rating and essential benefits in this brief overview. Uh, we, of course, had the, uh, if you want your plan, you can keep it, except you can't, but yes, you can. So those are the grandmother policies, which came when we had the uh, frozen experience of the uh, uh, Fed.gov website for the exchanges. Uh, and so we had these policies implemented in many states, which, in effect, uh, had continuing life uh, after death, and some of them continuing on uh, further uh, as a transitional policy, which looks like that transition may even continue in some cases, which changed a lot of the calculations under the law. Uh, also, we have uh, Trump administration initiatives to begin to chip away at what the Affordable Care Act had prescribed as its general regimen. 
most notably uh, in terms of some proposed rules, and some of which have been actually issued as final rules, uh, going to uh, allowing for uh, a, a change in short-term limited duration plans. So that hasn't dropped fully, uh, but the Ob Obama administration had first r reduced their maximum duration to three months. Now we're potentially back to less than 12 months guaranteed renewability, still a little up in the air, but we'll see how that drops. And the association health plans uh, as another area in which alternative vehicles uh, for finding some other route to uh, benefits would occur. Uh, we also had the uh, many transitions in uh, phases of exchanges. Uh, the vision once uh, proposed a lot of different things, assuming most states would exchange, would establish those exchanges. Uh, that's a high water mark there that Scott put in for at the peak. We're actually down a little bit, good bit down from that. Uh, so we obviously have mostly federally run exchanges. Uh, we also still have people continuing to uh, get coverage in one form or another off exchange. Well, that may be uh, squeezing down a bit as premiums have uh, been a little bit uh, more distorted lately. Uh, and the idea of what the exchanges could do got cut back a good bit. We'll also hear from Joel Ariel a good bit on that. Shop exchange is another idea that was supposedly going to take off, which didn't really get off the ground, and is essentially, except for maybe a couple of states, still keeping a ghost of them around, uh, pretty much gone. Uh, and most of those were just in a, in a few states. Uh, of course, we do have some congressional offices which are now considered small businesses that can uh, operate on the exchange. But that just is one of those little improvisations that happened along the way. Uh, we also have the uh, stabilization and subsidy, which has a lot of life to it in the courts right now. Uh, the transitional risk corridor program where Congress tried to explicitly clip its wings with an appropriation rider. We have a lot of litigation about that still continuing on, uh, but whether or not they were had to be the payments had to be budget neutral, uh, and uh, we've still potentially even have a class action case, I guess, coming up on that one uh, as well. Um, the most recent decision, though, uh, suggests uh, in the uh, uh, Federal Circuit for the Court of Claims uh, that uh, at least by a two-to-one decision subject to further appeals that it looks like uh, the view of not providing that money is, is going to hold. We also have transitional reinsurance program. This used to be a bigger deal. These are all, these were Both of these first two were three-year programs. There was amount of money was seemingly missing. They didn't uh, raise the tax enough. So it turned out that the Treasury got the money, or the insurers got the money rather than the Treasury. Uh, I don't know how much more life that has to go after it, but, but Seth may have some points on that. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, another type of reinsurance gets imparted into this without the standard uh, tax uh, approach of the ACA, where they're trying to use waivers uh, at the state level to provide pass-through funding to basically uh, bring down premiums and say, look how much money you saved in the aggregate uh, with a lot of uh, perhaps optimistic assumptions along the way. Uh, sometimes you may have to require some actual state money in this, but we'll see. Uh, the uh, cost-sharing reduction uh, payments have been have a long history on this, uh, both uh, well, primarily in litigation, but a settlement uh, late last year uh, kind of parked what had been a uh, ruling at the federal district court level, uh, saying the House could sue the administration for an unappropriated uh, uh, spending of money, and of course the Trump administration finally got around to saying they thought it was illegal and cut this off in the fall of 2017. But that litigation also continues where folks are still trying to uh, capture that money under various theories. And in the meantime, it turns out that as long as the taxpayers will make up the difference, it really doesn't matter. Everybody goes home happy except for those who don't get subsidized uh, with silver loading with a different workaround. So you always get something else out of the ACA than what you started with. Uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, we have the original templates for what the expansion was supposed to be. Uh, the Supreme Court case turned that around, and then we got into state political decisions. Gradually, the states have been creeping closer to doing more of this, uh, some states this year as well, uh, sometimes uh, making it more attractive in red states by attaching work requirement waivers to this, although we'll have some discussion on whether those work requirement waivers are going to get through in light of a recent decision in the Kentucky case. Uh, and some others are still pending, have actually been improved in, in three states and more are trying to line up for that. But we'll see how that uh, carries out along the way. Uh, in addition to that, we've got uh, cost and premium containment, which once upon a time, there was going to be this Cadillac tax, which was going to keep employers from having very expensive plans. Turned out that, that didn't go over very well politically, so we've been delaying it and delaying it, and perhaps uh, it'll happen in 2022, but in all likelihood, probably not. IPAB used to be, well, someday they'll challenge us in court when it's uh, ripe, 
but it turned out that in the uh, latest piece of legislation, it was repealed without ever having gone into operation or appointing anybody uh, in early 2018. Uh, CMMI is kind of, those are creeping along. We won't go into great detail on this, this is in Scott's slides, but basically uh, a mixed bag and not a whole lot of proof of uh, concept broadly uh, in terms of the, the cost savings from it. Rate review and implementation, some minor tweaks on that, uh, relaxing it, but not a big consequence, and uh, somewhat similar for medical loss ratio. They may have something more on that. So to wrap this up before we go to our panel, uh, that's kind of the administrative law story. There have been a few statutory changes along the way, but not many. Uh, but this really was a, uh, some have called it a perfect storm uh, for continued litigation. Now, at any time in a complex regulatory state with a lot of money at stake, uh, there's necessarily going to be a lot of complex rulemaking, people challenging it, the winners and the losers and the rent seekers all climbing on board. But beyond that, what seemed to be unique, and this is one perspective, other panelists may have others, uh, how the ACA was enacted had a good bit in why this continued to be an uh, infinity war uh, beyond uh, normal uh, circumstances. It was not supposed to be the final loss. There were a lot of things to clean up, and we ended up with something that had to be somewhat uh, adjusted after the fact uh, in a uh, messy manner without clear intent as to what uh, Congress may have even been trying to do uh, at all times. It was a bit of a partisan enactment on both sides, uh, but that fueled the pressure for continuing uh, fighting this uh, by various uh, less orthodox means uh, and extreme measures, and uh, a little, I think, rankling at the departures along the way from the official cover story, which was used to sell this. You could count many of them, but uh, the individual mandate, was it a penalty, was it a tax, uh, whether raising taxes, uh, were all the other provisions severable or not. You can get con inconsistent stories along the way. The lags in, in uh, implementation and enforcement, the timing was always a little off. Even some of the payments tend to catch up about a year later. So you're always chasing after what was never fully settled. And so this intertwined set of interconnected provisions where as soon as you change one, it sets another off. Also, the resulting system relied a lot heavily on other actors outside of the federal system to play along, whether they're employers or states, and that meant a lot of bargaining and negotiation along the way, more opportunities for resistance, uh, heavily dependent on state buy-in along the way, uh, as well as uh, keeping insurers uh, happy, as well as employers. And uh, then we had the change in uh, the partisan climate, uh, political climate and partisan control. Uh, plus, we're... Uh, trying to fix things without the usual uh, approaches to uh, adjust them along the way. Uh, the legislative process pretty much disabled, difficulty to deal with technical corrections, uh, no money for implementation through appropriations, and then when you're dealing with health care, you've got a lot of ethical and moral concerns which tend to make people do things beyond what is just uh, short-term economic calculations. So all these led to challenges, but we've got most of the constitutional ones out of the way, and we're now talking about who gets paid and how much. Uh, more of the uh, administrative actions are being challenged, but this continuing uh, Litigation and rulemaking uh, fuels further uncertainty. So that's the uh, quick overview to hopefully uh, have some of the panel not have to rehash as much of where we've been in the past, although there's many more details to all these things. And we have four uh, excellent, distinct panelists today. If I've done my job well, they won't agree with each other. They'll talk about entirely different things, and we'll find out it's another Rashomon experience in uh, what the ACA really means. Uh, but our first speaker will be, uh, and I'll introduce them separately uh, in sequence when they speak. Uh, this is not everything they know about the ACA, because that would have us here for about uh, 20 to 30 hours at a minimum. But their best of thoughts on uh, some of the above and their impressions on what's most significant about the route we've traveled in about a five to six minute burst. First, uh, Seth Chandler, uh, who uh, teaches at uh, the University of Houston Law Center. Uh, Seth, uh, rather unique because not only does he know the law, he actually once actually could, you know, run some numbers and uh, calculate things. He has quite a mathematical background and knows a lot about uh, insurance underwriting as well. Been in private practice before. Many of you may have uh, read uh, Seth's uh, many columns on Forbes.com, which have taken apart various aspects of ACA implementation and administrative law. So we'll start off with Seth. Go right ahead. Thank you. You want me to go from here? You can do either one. All right, you're I'll just with. go from right here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for an introduction that covered the whole ACA in like 15 minutes. Amazing. Um, 
You have, uh, if you look at this document and you brought a magnifying glass, you will be able to see my thoughts in some detail. But uh, let me just talk about the big picture here. And I think actually the big picture is a little bit about math, which is that we see an incredibly complex statute that basically is intending to enlist the insurance markets in something for which they were absolutely not designed. And they did that essentially for political reasons, I think not because that is the most sensible solution from some pure ideological perspective. And what we see is that if you fail to take into account either game theory, which is that people aren't going to take the moves of one party sitting down, or complexity theory, which is that when you enact something this detailed, the results are often difficult to foresee, you get what we have seen, which is a statute that has largely, not entirely, but largely remained untouched since it was enacted. And yet administrative policies and state policies that make it look like two or three completely different animals uh, as we move through. And I think there is a big picture lesson here for enacting large-scale nationwide enactments without really, really sweating the details even more than was done with the Affordable Care Act because I, I don't think really either side of this debate or either of the many sides should have a huge amount of pride in what has occurred. Um, and I think what we have is basically a statute that was underperforming relative to the expectations. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office projections on which this uh, legislation was at least ostensibly predicated, I think it's fair to say that virtually none of them have come true. And of course, there's plenty of blame to go around for that. But I think there were initially basically architectural flaws, engineering flaws in the original ACA, which made that result somewhat predictable. However, um, compounding that has been the fact that the statute has now been taken over by people who basically don't believe in it, but cannot get a bill that really guts it through Congress. And so what we see is various efforts to change the, ideolo the ideology of the statute, that is moving from a system in which one's financial fortunes were relatively invariant to one's medical risk to a system in which while there is still protection against risk uh, through <laughs> things like the subsidized individual market or Medicaid for those who are poor who live in blue states, nonetheless we see chipping away of that whereby we are going to see more insurance underwriting and more threats to move us into what uh, I have called many times an adverse selection death spiral. Um, we've also seen a statute that has become more expensive on a per capita basis than was anticipated. I'm not sure it's more expensive overall than was anticipated because so many fewer people are being served by it. But nonetheless, if you look at one of my graphics, you will see, I think it's towards the end with a nice green color, you will see that the amount of subsidies paid by the federal government for these uh, individual policies has gone up really quite substantially. Um, so the other thing that we've now seen, though, is that one of the features of the Trump administration's actions is that it has left the states free to some extent to recreate the Affordable Care Act on their own. And we see some efforts in that direction. We see a few jurisdictions either introducing their own individual mandate or, as in the case of Vermont, saying, well, gosh, we'll really think about doing it really, really seriously. Um, we see a couple of states trying to reintroduce a reinsurance scheme, which I think has distributional consequences which some of the more liberal proponents of it might really want to think about carefully. Um, and we see, for example, as I read this morning, and things change every day, Hawaii has decided basically to prohibit insurance underwriting. But what's curious to me about this is notwithstanding the freedom that now exists in theory to largely recreate the Affordable Care Act, so few states have gone down that road. 
Yes, states are talking about, well, maybe we should have an individual mandate, uh, but really the take up on that has been rather slow, and so it, it, it gets one to wonder if that was such a wonderful idea, why aren't states uh, performing it? Um, let me spend a few minutes talking about the various pieces of litigation that are now pending. Um, the first is, as you may know, uh, Texas has joined, I don't know, 19, 20 other states in seeking to have large swaths of the Affordable Care Act read, un, declared unconstitutional on grounds that, well, if the only basis for upholding it was that the individual mandate was a constitutionally justified tax, and now the tax is set to zero, then surely Congress couldn't have intended all that and the rest of the ACA, or at least chunks of it, should fall. My own humble opinion, and I say this as someone who is known not to be a great ACA fan, is that that lawsuit is going nowhere, it is meritless, um, and it rests on a misunderstanding, at best, of severability doctrine. So for those who have their hopes up that at last the judiciary will slay the Affordable Care Act, I would remit them to Congress and other avenues for having that done and not think that a court is going to rush in and do so. Um, let's talk about the risk corridors uh, decision that is now all in the news. As you may know, a federal judge in New Mexico ruled back in the spring that the system of risk adjustment that had been in place since 2014, while not illegal, according to the judge, was nonetheless arbitrary and capricious because the uh, CMS did not spell out why that, statu that statute needed to be implemented in a budget neutral manner. The Trump administration, although it has filed for reconsideration of that decision, has not appealed and over the weekend decided that, well, gosh, we are so concerned about fidelity to law, we better not make any of the payments that are due under that system, which amount to, I believe, 10, about $10 billion for the preceding year, and this is obviously throwing a major monkey wrench into the operations of the Affordable Care Act. My own view, which I will not be shy about stating, is that the New Mexico judge's decision is one of the worst pieces of judicial reasoning I have seen. It is shocking to me that it was uh, written that way. It's an argument for, you know, when I was a litigator, I was told, throw in the frivolous argument. You never know when the judge will buy it. And unfortunately, I think that's what's occurred here. And so one, while one may fault the Trump administration for seizing upon an errant judicial decision as a basis for refusing to make payments and throw, a, as I said, a monkey wrench into a statute they don't like, nonetheless, um, it really is a very poor decision. The judge reasoned that the federal government never spelled out why risk corridors was going to be implemented in a budget neutral way. Just like, I imagine, they never spelled out in their EPA regulations why the law of gravity existed. The reason that risk corridors is budget neutral is Congress never appropriated any money for it. Where does the judge think that the money was supposed to come from to pay for this? And so uh, it really is a very mysterious decision that perhaps the judge will actually reconsider and maybe the suspension of risk corridor payments will be uh, terminated. Um, let me, I think, stop right there, give everyone else a chance, and I'll, I really do welcome your questions on anything contained in the 21 very, very small print slides that you might have. Thank you. And keep in mind, these are just appetizers, uh, but we will uh, cut off the buffet uh, a little bit later on. Uh, our, our next speaker, who could, again, exhaustively tell you everything about the ACA, uh, is uh, Tim Jost, who uh, is officially retired as the uh, Willard Family Professor of Law at the Washington and Lee University School of Law, but you wouldn't know it by how active uh, Tim still continues uh, to be in commenting on various aspects of ACA regulation uh, and, and litigation. Uh, I guess Tim also has a uh, book in the works. Uh, he's known uh, for his uh, voluminous uh, contributions, both uh, through health affairs and through the media, in trying to make some sense as the uh, horse whisperer of ACA regulation and litigation. Uh, and, and we're going to limit uh, Tim to uh, his opening most significant things, although he could go on much more exhaustively. Tim? Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for inviting me. And let me just say, I've given up on the book.
Okay. So <laughs> don't expect that. Uh, the ACA as adopted in 2010 was 900 pages long, including 10 titles covering the full range of health policy issues. Some provisions were very specific, but many were left intentionally vague. Congress was clear, however, as to the purpose of Title I as captured in its title, quality, affordable health care for all Americans. To achieve this end, the ACA <clears throat> delegated broad authority to federal agencies. 150 times in the ACA, the phrase is used, the secretary shall, and almost 50 times the phrase, the secretary mill, may, referring actually to several different secretaries. Title I also envisioned shared responsibility between the federal and state government. In many instances, most notably the implementation of the insurance exchanges, the premium stabilization programs, and the enforcement of the consumer protections, authority was delegated in the first instance to the states with fallback authority to the federal government. The Obama administration's implementation efforts started strong. It moved quickly to get the rules in place for uh, the reforms effective six months after enactment. There was initially also a lot of goodwill on the part of the states. All but one accepted the initial exchange implementation grants, while over half assumed responsibility for the temporary pre-existing condition high-risk pool program. The 2010 election, however, moved Congress and many states dramatically to the right. Before the 2010 elections, Democrats controlled 52 state legislative houses and the Republicans 33. After 2010, Republicans controlled 53 state houses and Democrats 32. Many Republicans had run for Congress or state office by demonizing the ACA and assumed a hard line of, of opposition after they were elected. As states swung against the ACA, it became clear that the Obama administration would have to rely on its backup authority under Section 1321 to itself implement many programs and provisions that Congress had hoped would be implemented by the states. It would also have to do so without initial ad additional funding beyond the single $1 billion appropriation in the initial law. And as far as I know, there have never been any appropriations for implementation since 2010. And it would have to rely on an expansive interpretation of executive authority, not on Congress, in which the House was now dominated by conservative Republicans to fix any problems in the statute. Finally, the administration faced constant litigation from right-wing advocacy organizations or states and constant House oversight hearings and really had to bunker down into a defensive posture to get its work done. Between 2010 and 2016, the Obama administration implemented the ACA with two primary goals. One, extending coverage for lower income Americans and protection for consumers, particularly those who had health problems. And two, avoiding offending powerful interests and creating unnecessary political controversy. It chose to preserve its resources and political capital to implement the heart of the ACA while letting many other provisions take a back seat. In particular, it voided, avoided confrontation with big employers, simply not implementing some provisions of the ACA that affected them and delaying the implementation of the employer mandate, as Tom described. It delayed implementation of the shop exchanges, focusing instead on the individual exchange. It avoided controversy by allowing people covered by noncompliant plans in 2013 to keep those plans in 2014, and it seems now eventually forever. The Obama administration made some questionable calls, but as the Supreme Court recognized in King v. Burwell, it tried to carry out the intention of Congress in writing the law. By the end of the Obama administration, there were signs that the ACA was in fact achieving its goals with 20 million people, new people covered, and health plans finally moving towards profitability in the individual market. Even as he was running for office, President Trump called for repeal of the ACA. As virtually his fa first presidential act on Inauguration Day in 2017, Donald Trump issued an executive order directing agencies to undermine its enforcement. In fact, however, the Trump administration's approach to the ACA has been quite complex. 
First, the administration has consistently criticized the ACA on every occasion possible and continued to lobby for its repeal. For those of us who read every press release coming out of the administration, it's funny that they always start out with the ACA is a total disaster, the ACA is failing, and then they go on to say something usually quite reasonable about uh, how it's going to be implemented. Um, second, however, uh, and this follows that, uh, the Trump administration has continued enforcement of the letter of the law. The clearest example of this is its refusal so far to allow Idaho to authorize health plans that violate the ACA. Regulations issued by the administration have tended to push the boundaries of what is legal under the ACA, in some instances too far, but on the whole the administration has enforced the law and until recently its actions have not lived up to its rhetoric. Third, in fact, the administration has tried within its own lights to make parts of the law work better. It has responded to ensure demands that it require special enrollment period eligibility validations, and it has responded to broker and agent demands for direct enrollment channels. The vast CMS civil service has continued to try to make the ACA work, and political appointees have generally not interfered. Fourth, the administration has prioritized allowing individual op individuals options for exiting the ACA individual and small group market. Thus it has supported zeroing out the individual mandate penalty, association health plans, and full year short term limited duration plans. The administration describes these in initiatives as offering more options and more affordable coverage to some but they inevitably make coverage more costly and less available for those who uh, have so far benefited from the ACA. Finally, the administration has taken positions where possible that have further undermined or delegitimized the ACA. Terminating cost-sharing reduction payments, though it paradoxically has made coverage more affordable for low-income beneficiaries, drove up premiums for those who do not have subsidies. The positions taken by the Trump administration in the Texas litigation threatens to destroy the ACA individual market. And just very briefly, I agree with Seth that that litigation is completely uh, illegitimate. Uh, however, uh, Texas handpicked the single judge in the country who might actually decide in their favor, uh, Judge Reed O'Connor in, in, in uh, Wichita Falls, who is an uh, extremely hostile judge to the ACA. Uh, and now uh, I think that, this, that uh, the states and the administration effectively are trying to uh, uh, block a possible appeal of, that, of, of whatever his decision may be. Uh, and I can talk maybe more about that later. Um, and finally, the announcement on Saturday, but I, I do think that is going to get sorted out, but possibly in the Fifth Circuit, and it's possibly going to be ugly before it does. The announcement on Saturday that the administration is holding off paying risk adjustment payments is, I think, unnecessary uh, and, uh, in, and will likely uh, raise premiums and reduce insurer participation, although I should note that a few minutes ago the administration put out all of the risk adjustment uh, figures for 2017, which is what the insurers really needed. Uh, and also I, I would note that the press release that went out on the risk adjustment program on Saturday was not an inflammatory press release. So I think it's another example of there's a lot of rhetoric, there are some things that are being done that I think could seriously undermine the ACA, but in fact the Trump administration continues to implement the law and enforce it uh, pretty much as written. Um, so we can talk about that a lot more later. Thank you, Tim. I never realized how calm and reasonable and moderate the Trump administration was until you endorsed that, but uh, interesting perspective. No, not in all things. <laughs> not in all things. I think this is just the best stuff. Uh, our, our third speaker, and uh, it's a return engagement because Joel was here at our December 2016th event, is, is Joel Ario, who has lengthy experience uh, with uh, public health policy at the federal and state level, currently at Manad Health. Uh, Joel also actually had to do this stuff, which 
which is different than many of the theorists here, uh, because he actually set up a lot of the underpinnings of this under difficult circumstances. At, uh, at that time, it was called something different at HHS, but later got transferred for budgetary reasons over to CMS, now known as Ochayo. And, and Joel has a lengthy history also as an uh, insurance regulator in several states uh, and, and a world of uh, practical experience. Joel also has to leave a little early today uh, at 10.30, so we'll steer some early discussion in your direction as well. But, but go right ahead, Joel, with uh, the best of uh, what, what you experienced and uh, what makes some sense out of this at a working practical level. Uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, again, I do I apologize. I'm going to have to exit promptly at 1030 to go visit one of the states, which is going to be my theme here. I think we're see, we'll see the states take uh, more leadership around ACA issues, and for better or worse, over the next uh, several years. It's always a challenge following Tim. He not only knows all the material that I know, um, but he diligently puts it down in beautiful paragraphs. And I'm, so I'm kind of rifting here a little bit, but try to make some more pointed comments. I also agreed with almost everything Seth uh, said. So I'm maybe going to try to mix it up a little bit more here, like Tom likes me to do. Random um, disagreement is what we're looking for. <laughs> Not random, hopefully, but, but, but some disagreement. But uh, anyway, um, let me start with the, uh, the, the, the point that Seth started with. He used kind of antiseptic language that uh, the, the future of the ACA may be that, that uh, I think the phrase was relatively invariant, is the intent of the NCA, uh, ACA is to be relatively invariant uh, to people's health conditions in terms of what they pay for uh, insurance. That clearly was the intent. Again, it was intended to be a patch for the part of the market that doesn't follow that process. Again, as I think everybody in this room probably knows, 85 to 90 percent of the market is invariant, totally invariant to health condition. If you're on a public program, there's no other public program where the government puts money into a program where it has some mixed incentive to say to people, we're going to pay you, but we're going to give you some incentive to not cover the people who most need that health care. So it just doesn't make sense in a public program to do that. No other public program does it. And in the employer marketplace, they figured out how to structure that marketplace so that no employer says, gee, the way I'm going to save money is identify the 5% of my population that is most expensive and make them pay more or kick them out of the plan entirely. It doesn't happen anywhere except in this 10 or 15% of the market. This F ACA is an effort to fill that patch, make it work there. But as Seth well stated, it's not easy to do because you know, if you're giving the money to private insurers, you have to put in a lot of rules to make sure that it doesn't be, uh, that they don't have uh, perverse incentives and so forth. And because we've had the implementation that we've had of this law, it has not met its goals. What it's done is instead of 25 to 30 million people being now in a robust individual market, we're you know, 10 to 15 million people in that market in continual trouble. But I will point out that, it, that before the ACA, people who had pre-existing conditions basically didn't get served by the market. They, could, they had to be an employer-based coverage or a public program if they had a, at least a serious uh, pre-existing condition because the laws did not protect them. And the proof is in the pudding there. Before the ACA, we had 215,000 people in high risk pools, which is often trumpeted as the alternative. Today, we have 10 million. Uh, in the ACA. They're not all in with pre-existing conditions, but as things go, increasingly more of them are. So the, so the law has been about half successful in that kind of metric from my perspective. I'm going to talk about three areas where I think the states are going to be stepping up over the next course of time, one way or the other, uh, on the ACA. And, and uh, Tim talked about the state legislatures in 2010, and I think this is really important history because you do hear a lot of places the ACA itself was Rift with controversy from the very beginning. It never was going to work. It should have never passed the way it passed. I came to the agency in August of 2010, six months after the law had passed. As Tim said, 49 states, every state except Minnesota, had taken money to start developing a state exchange. Had applied for and received federal, well, they didn't, not every state received their money because they started backtracking, but every state had applied for and was authorized to get a grant to plan an exchange. Then the 2010 election happened, and as Tim said, the Republicans saw there was gold in, the, in, in uh, political terms in opposing the ACA. He talked about legislative changes. To me, the, fo the, the focal point is the governors. Eleven states in 2010 switched from Democrat to Republican governors. They included Pennsylvania, 
uh, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, all the swing states politically switched to Republican. Every one of those states I was working with, my staff were working with to build exchanges. Of those 11, 10 of them never went forward on exchanges. The only one that did, interestingly, was New Mexico, which is still in the, in the hunt here. By the way, all 10 of those states that are still Republican governors are up this year. Most of them have close races. You could see an re exact reversal of 2010 where things switch the other way and we have an experience like Virginia in New Jersey, which got Democratic governors last year and changed quite profoundly the way in which they addressed the ACA. You could see, you know, a, a half dozen or more of those uh, this year. So it's not, in, this elections matter, it's not insignificant. So what, what do they matter for with the ACA? What would the states do? Well, first of all, you know, we have the, the states having flexibility on at least three dimensions of the ACA that are very, very important. One is the mandate. Um, without a mandate, any insurance person will tell you the law isn't going to work very well. You can't give people insurance on a guaranteed issue basis and then say you get to choose when you buy it. So the states that don't put back a mandate, they're going to continue to have trouble. But we saw a couple do it already. New Jersey's done it. Vermont is in the process of doing it. D.C.'s done it. California's debating it seriously. I think you will see a number of states recognizing the reality of the insurance world that you can't have guaranteed issue without a mandate. Um, we'll see how that, that plays out. So that's number one that states can choose on. Number two, as Tim said, the, the states now have options to take people out of the risk pool the healthier lives. It's very attractive. Any employer could save huge amounts of money by taking the 5% that costs the most money out of their risk pool. And, and, you know, too bad for them, but the rest of the people would have pretty good rates. So now states have that choice. Put people, allow people to have robust short-term plans that go longer, put people into association plans that are broader in scope than they used to be, and it's potential. And I keep watching this. Um, Idaho, the commissioner out there keeps saying that, you know, that he's going to get a different kind of deal. I, Dean Cameron's a great guy. He's well uh, intentioned, I think, here. He says, I don't want to go to short-term plans outside the risk pool. I don't want to have a dual risk pool and have people peeled away from my, I have an exchange in my state. I want to protect that. But I do want a little relief on the guaranteed issue. So I want a little relative in, uh, variance in, in price. So we may now have a whole other set of permutations in the middle here where you can keep people in the risk pool but charge them 30% more if they have a certain kind of pre-existing condition and so forth. You just may see a lot more variance in what people are doing at the state level with their insurance. And the more they go that route, there's a reason why the insurers tell the employers, we're not, we, either we, we take everybody and there's no accepting people. That's how the market works best. If you start saying, well, we're going to have all these little side deals, pretty soon you have a deteriorated risk pool. Any insurance person will tell you that. So states are going to make their choices. I think some states are going to go down the path of continuing to deconstruct their risk pools. They won't have as good a situation, at least for the people with pre-existing conditions. Um, some people will get better rates in the short term as long as they stay healthy. But that's the situation I think you'll see. But I do think you'll see a bunch of blue states. And over time, as those states work better, probably more states moving in this direction. Uh, the little known secret of the ACA was during the pre-ACA world, the insurers advertised how the five states that had guaranteed issue without a mandate didn't, um, didn't repeal those mandates. I mean, that they, they, their markets didn't work. What they didn't emphasize was that none of them repealed guaranteed issue because once you tell people they're protected, even if they have a pre-existing condition, they're protected, it's very hard for a state to roll that back. So I think you'll see states wrestling with not wanting to roll that back and if they don't roll back, they'll have to come to a mandate uh, at some point probably to make it work. Or we'll have single payer of some sort. That's the other op option. Second area is the exchanges. I'll cover the other two areas very briefly because I okay. see I'm okay. doing, losing my time. The exchanges themselves, um, they're built on technology. The big technology companies, the Accentures of the world, the Get Insureds of the world, they already run the federal exchange, the state exchanges, California, and so forth. Um, and, and so you can, on the, on the Republican side, you can say the future of the exchanges is privatize them. Uh, extreme version of this would be they have something called enhanced uh, 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 direct enrollment. Outsource the whole thing to the Amazons of the world and say you can do this consumer service better than we can. That is a possible model of full privatization 
Other people will say, no, don't do that, but, but, but hire the, the same technology companies instead of just outsourcing it to them without a lot of restriction. Work with them through vendor relationships. This is what every state does today. It's what the federal government does. It's what Nevada's about to do to go back to being a state exchange. Working with one of the technology companies as a vendor, I will predict to you that within five years, the more there'll be more privatization, if you want to use a Republican term, more collaboration um, and outsourcing, if you want to use a Democratic term. But basically, we will see continued improvement in the technologies here and the same way in which employer-based web pages are better and better every year, these web pages will continue to get better and better. And maybe we'll get the federal government out of doing some of the kind of back and forth shenanigans they do every year now by having more of this more solidly in the states. Every state will be in a place to be able to hire one of these vendors much safer than in the past. And then finally, 1332, well, another reason why the states will probably want to take their own vendor relationships is healthcare.gov is not likely to be terribly flexible for a state, red or blue, that wants to experiment broadly with what it's doing with its exchange. They'll probably have to have a vendor relationship with somebody in the private sector that will be able to create that kind of flexibility for them. So I think you will see more and more robust uh, 1332 activity, although to date you've really only seen Hawaii with an employer one and reinsurance in, in three states, probably four more this year. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Uh, and we will follow up uh, shortly. Uh, our final speaker uh, is Chris Condalusi, uh, who uh, operates his own uh, firm, CC Law and Policy. Uh, Chris is uh, widely known for uh, many comments and analysis these days on the spawn of the ACA, what it's meant on the regulatory side, particularly focus upon uh, impact on uh, employers. Uh, smaller insurers. Uh, Chris's background includes uh, being there. Uh, I don't know if you want to say you want to credit it for being at the creation <laughs> by the Senate Finance Committee. And his bio says that he was there responsible for all the uh, tax uh, taxes included under the Act. So you know the person to blame for that one. Uh, but um, Chris has uh, a, a wide range of, of view on uh, regulation and background on this. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. And it is always a fine line of, of trying to talk about my background, it's, it's one, you want to obviously show your credibility and the experience that you, you have, you have over, over the years, but also at the same time, you don't want people to throw things at you <laughs> based on what you were involved in. And to Tom's point, uh, so when I was, on, I was on the finance committee, um, I was tax counsel, uh, I'm an employee benefit attorney by training, and so yes, I was on tax staff and therefore was point on all the taxes under the ACA, but I also was an ERISA attorney, so therefore I had a background in state insurance law, uh, some obviously on the employer group side of the world, and through that I kind of leveraged or kind of shoehorned my way into the health staff. So during the development of the ACA, I was point on all the taxes, but I also played with the health staff as well. And interestingly enough, now, running my own practice, all I do is, is health. I, I, I do some tax, obviously. There are many issues that crop up uh, when it comes to the ACA and the Im implementation of, um, but it really is focusing on the individual market uh, as well as the group market. Um, so just with that background, let me just dive in to say I'll, I'll probably riff as well. As, as Joel just said, I don't have any prepared remarks per se, but I do have, let's say, three to four areas of the law that I want to talk through and almost juxtapose what Congress was thinking and how the previous administration implemented the law and effectuated to a certain degree what, or didn't effectuate to a certain degree what Congress was thinking. Now, I have lamented in my comments that sadly, uh, congressional intent is not what it used to be. Um, so therefore, take with a grain of salt, I suppose, my comments on what the drafters were thinking at the time of developing the ACA. And I want to start with the essential health benefits as an example of what the drafters were thinking when they developed that rule and then how that rule was implemented uh, post-enactment. When it came to the essential health benefits, um, the drafters said to themselves, look, there are a lot of states with state benefit mandates out there that have a whole host of benefit mandates. And as we all know, additional benefit mandates or additional coverage requirements carries with it cost. 
There's reasons for those coverage requirements, moral, social, whatever you want to add to that label or, or label those coverage requirements. But the objective side of this is that those coverage requirements carry with them cost. So we saw these states that were high, higher cost states, at least when it comes to the benefit nature. So there's other reasons why states were higher cost relative to other states. But at least just focusing on the coverage requirements and benefit mandates, that's what we identified. But we also identified that there are some states that have some benefit mandates that, mm, you know what, don't really provide a comprehensive level of coverage. Now, it was an arbitrary decision on the drafter's part of like what comprehensive coverage is or should be. But it leads to say it was an arbitrary decision that we made where we said there were some states out there that didn't have good enough benefit mandates. I almost put it that simply. So we said, let's come up with uniform rules. Let's come up with a uniform standard that those states that have probably too many benefit mandates and therefore is creating higher costs for those constituents in that particular state, let's bring them down a notch. But let's also at the same time bring up those states that were, have coverage requirements that weren't good enough. So you almost have an equaling of the playing field. And we came up with a uniform rule. And that uniform rule is the essential health benefits. It's the 10 benefit and services that are enumerated in the statute and says, you individual mandate, or excuse me, you individual market plan must cover these 10 services, 10 benefits slash services. Small group market, same thing. When the law passed and the law started to be implemented and Joel, Tim, and others could probably speak to this a little bit better than I because I, I was not in the previous administration. I was in Congress and then left to go back to the private sector. But my job was analyzing what was going on and how the law was being implemented. And I observed that states went to HHS and said, huh, there's a reason why we have our benefit mandates. And by the way, a legislature two years ago actually drew blood to get this particular benefit mandate into the law. And if we're going to take it out, that's not going to go over very well. So HHS had conversations, and the statute did require uh, HHS to uh, consult with the NAIC and other expert-type organization panels out there, either government-related, quasi-public-private, to determine how the law should work in relation to the essential health benefits. And so what the ultimate decision was, for right or wrong, and there's reasons for why, in my opinion, HHS came down the way they did, was they said, look, even though Congress wanted this uniformity of everyone being subject to these 10 benefit, ser benefits and services, we're going to allow states to actually include in their essential health benefits package benefit mandates that were in the law, in that state law, as of December 31, 2011. And that at least calmed, in my opinion, much of the blowback of the states in response to what Congress did, and HHS simply responding to the states and trying to effectuate what Congress wanted to make a law work, came to a rule which now allows states to have more benefit mandates than the next state based on the essential health benefit benchmark plan, which again includes some of these previous benefit mandates. So that's just one example in, in, you know, in light of or trying to speak to the, the topic or the title of our panel here is, to me, that's an example where Congress wanted to do something, one thing, and the administration, when implementing the law, to a certain degree changed what Congress was thinking. Um, another example is the employer mandate. I'll mention the employer mandate for a moment. Uh, Congress said to themselves, look, we have this, these subsidies, and these subsidies are going to be available to folks in the individual market, which are people who don't have employer coverage by definition. And you know what? We don't want employers to discontinue their group plan throw their people in the individual market to access the subsidy because that's just free riding on the government. That's sending your people so those individuals can now get government subsidies as opposed to the employer 
subsidy, which really at the end of the day is compensation, but at the same time it's the employer subsidy versus the government subsidy. So when we were developing the employer mandate, we first called it the free rider penalty. We didn't call it the employer mandate, we called it the free rider penalty. That's just an aside for a moment. So as we developed the employer mandate penalty tax, which is what it ultimately is called, although it has the name shared responsibility, at the end of the day it is a penalty tax, similar to the individual mandate, we needed to put a process in place through which the tax can be administered. Can be, uh, the IRS can determine what employer actually is going to be subject to the penalty tax and what employer might not. Now there are certain requirements that an employer must meet in order to avoid the imposition of the penalty tax. And I don't want to speak so much to what those criteria are and the merits of the criteria that an employer has to meet to avoid the penalty, but I want to talk to the administration of the penalty. And that is, as a tax writer especially, when you put a tax into the law, you need to allow the IRS to somehow enforce that law. And the best way to enforce a tax is through some sort of notice requirement. So there is a notice requirement uh, where the IRS reaches out to the employer who is supposed to be subject to the penalty tax to say, hey, by the way, we think, we being the IRS, think you, employer, are subject to the penalty tax. Well, there was another notice requirement that we put into the law as well. And that notice requirement was actually supposed to come from an ACA exchange. In other words, we said to ourselves, look, we have the tax code here, and we have this system of determining subsidy eligibility, so eligibility for the premium subsidies for the individual market over here. And to a certain degree, it's HHS's uh, Federal Data Services Hub and processes that HHS is putting into place, but we're also going to rely on the ACA exchanges to almost be the first receiver of the information from those individuals saying, hey, I am eligible for a subsidy. Well, the drafter said to themselves, we need a step in the process where those organizations, that entity that is receiving the information on whether someone is eligible for a subsidy or not, needs to tell the employer, hey, your employee received a subsidy because they gave us information and we, the organization, based on the processes that HHS put into place, determined that this particular employee was eligible for the subsidy. And as the law was being implemented, the AC exchanges and HHS were unable, in my opinion at least, to put a process in place where those organizations could send that notice to the employer informing them of, hey, Chris, your employee was found eligible for a premium subsidy. Now the reason why we put this step in for the AC exchange to, to notify the employer before the IRS did is because we wanted the employer to see that notice and go, oh shoot, I need to fix whatever I didn't comply with for these, again, coverage requirements to avoid the penalty. And the employer would rectify, they would cure the problem that was identified. And because that notice was never provided, many employers just were oblivious to the fact that they might be subject to an employer mandate penalty tax. And now, beginning November of last year, the IRS has started sending their own letters saying, hey, we IRS think that you are subject to an employer mandate penalty tax. And I told you before, that's part of how you administer a tax is you have the IRS send a notice. But the way we structured the employer mandate and knowing that you had this system of tax and this system of determining eligibility for a premium subsidy were two different systems. We had two different notice requirements. And because processes were not put into place for a myriad of reasons, you had a little bit of a disconnect between what Congress always intended and what the reality was when it came to implementing the law. So that's another example of um, the employer, uh, of Congress wanting something and the administration uh, not doing what at least Congress had always intended, or in my opinion, following the statute that Congress actually drafted. So those are just two examples 
where Congress intended something, the, previ the previous administration did something differently. And I will note, and then I'll turn it back to Tom for questions, is I don't fault the previous administration for doing many of the things that they did. They had a hostile Congress. They had many states, as Joel and others have articulated, where the politics shifted post-enactment of ACA, which threw wrenches in the system of implementing the law. So I don't fault the administration for doing many of the things in the creative interpretation of the statute that they came up with to make the law work, but the reality is that is what the previous administration had to do in many respects to make the law work and to make the law work the way that they wanted the policy to work. So with that, Tom, I'll turn it back. All right, we seem to be in a particularly forgiving mood this morning. It's interesting. <laughs> uh, I guess the fires have turned down a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about one of Chris's specialties, association health plans, and some further discussion. Uh, let me switch back, though, because Joel's on a, a shorter clock, and I'll reverse some of my uh, order here. Um, in terms of the exchanges, and I understand you know, all the things that have evolved, and we went through many mutations and variations of this in order to get something out on the street that could work. How much was lost of, maybe it was an unrealistic vision, as so these exchanges were gonna be a Swiss army knife. I mean, they could do everything. They were gonna you know, tightly evaluate everything in the marketplace, create this you know, great set of options, and they were gonna be pretty regulatory. And then you found out what you had to do in practice and the load got lightened quite a bit. Uh, so reflect on that as to how far we've come from what originally was supposedly, you know, your, your marching orders and then what could happen. But then also just how much of an appetite is there really even still, even if politics changes, for states to get their hands in deep on this. They say a lot. They like to take money. I'm not sure if they like to take responsibility. So tee that up. Uh, great, great question. First, the mea culpa part of this that my two favorite states and two favorite people with, who were both lead, leaders in their states which shall remain nameless um, were the people who wanted to build the most complicated uh, exchanges and they both failed uh, pretty uh, seriously um, in those efforts and so I think your first point yeah. is well taken that the ambition of what you can accomplish in an exchange was at a fairly ambitious level uh, to start and people have taken some learning from that. The second thing to say, though, is that that's a, re in big picture terms, that was a particularly aberrational thing at that point in time. I, from the beginning, bought eHealth came in the first couple weeks I was there and said, you know, we've been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years. We know something about selling insurance over the web. You gotta work with us. I thought it was a great idea. Um, Lenny Davis, by the way, was their person at that time, interestingly, in the news again today. Um, and and uh, we started a, a, a process of looking at how to allow web brokers, we call them, to work with the exchanges and do a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. But, you know, in general, if you want an Amazon-like experience, you probably want to hire Amazon, not the state of California, to run your exchange in the mechanics of it. You need, there's a governance structure on top of that. But the mechanics of the exchange you ought to hire. So I think we're moving towards that now. In fairness to the Obama administration, they had a lot of priorities, so we never did get there. But if we had gotten there originally with where we are today, President Obama could have come on the, on the television sets in November of 2013 and said, you know, healthcare.gov, choke point, not working so well, but no big deal because here's 10 vendors who've been doing this for a long time. They're all in league with us. They're all collaborating with us, and they can offer you exactly the same experience on their web page that you would get on healthcare.gov, so go to them instead. That should have been done at the beginning. Again, I'm not faulting anybody because a lot of priorities. Had it been done, we might have a quite different story about the exchanges. We are getting there now. The Trump administration has been, frankly, more of a champion, Chris knows a lot about this, of you know, how much you can harness of the private sector to do this. So I think we're moving down the track to having the mechanics of the exchanges run by people who specialize in the consumer experience and what works best on a web page and how do you put things together. There's a governance structure on top of that, though, that's very important. And so there's two models out there right now for how this could work in the future. One is that states go back to state-based exchanges and say, it's easy now. I can hire, get insured, say, as a company that runs the front end of the California exchange, covered California Day, fairly regulatory 
exchange. There are many, so there are many other companies out there that run these. I can hire these guys. They've proven that they can do it in a lot of states. They've proven they can do it for large employers. Some of them are bigger than some of the states. Um, so the technology is an easy lift now. All I got to worry about is the governance. To your point, Tom, unfortunately, I do find there's a psychic barrier, which is the 18 states that cross the line to say, we're going to create a governance structure for our own state exchange. We don't want the federal government running it for us. Um, are all still dead set on protecting that. The other states that did not do that are still psychically like, I'm not ready to do it. I think that's going to come down, though. That's going to erode over time, especially if the federal government continues to play as many games with healthcare.gov as they do, and continuing to charge more money for that. There, these technologies are cheaper than the way the federal government runs it. But the state then would be in the sovereignty of making decisions, making sure that people are protected, the laws are followed, and so forth. So that model I, I like. Nevada's down that model. They're probably going to announce something in August about a new vendor that they're going to have, and they're going to go back to a full state exchange. The other model is what the Trump administration calls enhanced direct enrollment, and it's possible they would do the whole privatization thing, just say, we're eliminating healthcare.gov more or less. They still have to have some kind of data hub for IRS connection and so forth, but we're basically eliminating it and, and outsourcing it completely to the e-health of the world, and we'll let Google search pages determine which of these uh, uh, enhanced direct enrollment partners, maybe it's a big insurer like Florida Blue, maybe it's e-health, um, which of them are the best at selling, selling this type of insurance over the web. That model has huge questions about who's actually in charge and how are the rules followed and so forth. How is that governed? So I think the first model is much better, but I, right. I think they, they, they could evolve okay. that way. Okay, Chris was dying to jump in first. We don't want to go too long on this, but a couple of minutes each. Yeah. I, I will be brief to say, so in the interest of time, I, I wanted to bring up the exchange as an example of kind of where Congress was and, and where things went. You know, at least early on in the process, Finance Committee, uh, historically a bipartisan committee. I was on Republican staff. We worked very closely with our Democratic staff, and really about 80% of the law was written during the time our finance committee staffs were working together. Um, it wasn't until September of, of 2010, or 20, 2009, that is, uh, where you know everyone kind of went to their corner, sadly, in my opinion, and uh, things went from there. But when it came to the exchanges, finance committee, we actually wanted an exchange structure that was more or less... Uh, as, as Joel described, more on the privatized uh, uh, kind of flavor, where we said, look, there are these private exchanges, there are these companies that are already out there, the technology is there, why recreate the wheel? Let's just build off of what the private sector is doing. So we went in that direction, but then we realized, well, we have this premium subsidy, which is a government subsidy, and for eligibility purposes, tax return data is used and, and, and there's uh, protections around the, the sharing of that data. So we said, well, we do need some sort of governance structure. We do need some sort of government oversight. So we're like, okay, we can't just totally privatize it. We need to have something. So we had somewhat of a governance structure initially in the exchange idea, the exchange structure that we were contemplating when the, when the debate you know, went partisan uh, post-September 2009, in my opinion, the exchanges and the structure became that much more regulatory. Post-enactment, HHS ran into many of the issues that Joel, I think, articulated, which is priorities, but also governance and, and some states wanting to really own and infuse specific consumer protections in there, which then created the exchange as almost a, uh, a heavily regulated body, which I would argue has led to much of the problems of the ambition of, hey, we want this, but we could only get this because of many of the governance issues and regulatory issues that they ran into, and then they just spent a lot of money uh, trying to navigate those rules. So right. at least that's a difference between what Congress was thinking and, and what's going on now. The last thing I'll say about this administration is they do buy into the, the privatizing of the state-based exchanges and or healthcare.gov. And their idea is, is look, there's technology out there that these third parties can utilize, and there could be a web system, a uh, information, an application program interface between the user and the back-end you know, government uh, federal data service hub where all of this information is going to be kept secure. And these third parties can actually be the front face, 
be the proxy of the ACA exchanges. And this administration believes that will facilitate enrollment to a greater degree than, for example, the navigators would. So you see a shift in policy under this administration saying, look, the previous administration relied on navigators believing that they could be facilitators in enrollment. But you know what? There wasn't a big bang for the buck by relying on navigators. So instead, let's move over to the private sector. Let's throw some resources to the private sector and making sure the technology works and the information is protected, and that would enable you to facilitate enrollment to a better degree. We'll see how that rolls, but we right. will expect. Chris. Uh, All right, Tim wanted to jump in, and we, you know, there's no source of uh, imagination in jumping the genetic pool and crossbreeding with some type of hybrid, in which basically someone gets paid and public officials get to claim credit and shed blame. But let's have Tim's thoughts on this quickly. Yeah, I mean, in the original statute, as it was adopted, uh, there were four functions for exchanges. One was to uh, determine eligibility for uh, federal subsidies. Second was to enroll people in health insurance. Third was to regulate um, or certify plans for participation in the exchange, which was a regulatory role. And then the fourth was consumer assistance. And uh, I think that even the Obama administration and the Trump administration even more turned over the certification function to the states, basically relied on the existing state regulatory infrastructure. Um, and, and that was largely done by the Obama administration. The Trump administration took it a step further. And in fact, in the latest payment rule, they tried to take it a step further. And the state said, no, we don't want any more work. So it's not completely done, but that's been largely done. Second, the eligibility for federal subsidies. I, for one, am a little nervous about allowing private contractors to determine entirely on their own whether someone is eligible for a sizable federal subsidy or not. And I think that function should remain with the government, and I hope that it does. In terms of enrollment and consumer assistance, um, those functions um, have largely been much of it kind of done by the by the private sector all along, uh, although usually through contracting with the state or federal government rather than more directly. Um, but uh, I think that clearly the trend now is to try to privatize those, as both Joel and Chris said. Um, the concern that I have and that consumer advocates have is that once you're basically just dealing with an insurance broker, be it a web bro – well, a web broker is what it's going to be um, – in, in, in getting insurance, um, there's nervousness as to whether the consumer's interest will come, for, come first. Uh, brokers are paid on commission, and uh, I think what we're likely to see is, uh, you know, at the top of the, the page it will say, best plans, and those best plans are the ones that pay the highest commission. Uh, and aren't necessarily the best plan for the consumers. I've shopped on the exchange several times, on the federal exchange with my sons. It works very well at this point. Uh, and so I'm not sure how much uh, more uh, private sector can improve it. It's the private sector and understructure is there anyway. Um, but I think that is the concern, that if we just completely privatize the enrollment and consumer assistance process, it's going to work very well for agents and brokers and perhaps not so well for consumers. Okay, so I'm going to mandate can I, a, a Tom, shift can I in just uh, get, topics. Can I do one real quick? Does this very one, quickly. Very this quickly. Pains We're going to do one, this for the whole thing. It's yeah. one of the few issues on which neither one of us has been able to persuade the other, so we <laughs> you combat on this issue. But I, Tim's absolutely right. The enrollment should go to the private sector and the other things, so the QHPs already are in the insurance departments and the consumer assistance is basically tied up with enrollment. Leave eligibility to decide it is going to have to remain a federal function. So the only question is who's better at selling insurance to consumers, Amazon or a state or federal government? And to say that healthcare.gov works fairly well, yes, compared to what, how it used to be, but compared to the state of the art in the private sector, it's not even close. I guarantee you that Amazon and other people like that will be Seven better the at the enrollment the process than the federal government or the states. And oh. I would just say. All right. All right. All right. I knew it was going to happen. Four lawyers with different <laughs> opinions. What could go wrong? We'll get through that, two topics. Tom. That, that <laughs> someone as knowledgeable as Tim Jost can use healthcare.gov and shop intelligently. I don't think that's true for most people. Amen. Okay. I'm going to mandate a, a switch in uh, topics to the mandate 
Uh, you know, the stuff, problem is you can't sell this stuff unless you force people to buy it, it seems like. Uh, but the question is, can we actually do that legally or politically? So we've got uh, still on the table uh, what remains of a limping individual mandate. I know there was some skepticism as to the legal challenge on that, and I'll push back on that in a moment. And that employer mandate, which looks like it's going to sock uh, a few unwary employers with some pretty disproportionate penalties. Do we think this is just going to cruise along and that somehow we're going to cobble together Together, some other version of an individual mandate, uh, or do we have to look in another direction in the same way? Uh, is th are things a little out of sync? The reason why the employer mandate was delayed to begin with, that it maybe didn't actually fly when you began to match up the penalties relative to who it's going to hit. I think the employer mandate stays. Uh, I think the way in which Congress put together the individual mandate, uh, for political reasons, we were forced to water down the penalty amount. Uh, we were forced to essentially neuter the IRS when it came to enforcing the individual mandate. So I have uh, staked a position that I don't believe the individual mandate has been effective as it has been enacted by Congress. There are ways to have made that individual mandate that much more effective, but the way Congress developed, the way we developed it, it was not effective. And if states, in my opinion, and I'll say this last thing and then turn it over, if states are going to mirror what the federal individual mandate is and was, well, then the state's individual mandate is not going to be effective. So I, I do believe you do need some sort of stick or incentive to get people into the market, but at least the way this individual mandate, the federal individual mandate is structured currently, it's not effective. And I'll have two comments on this. First, the employer mandate was always a terrible idea. It continued the coupling of the American employment market, which is a lumpy, problematic market, to the insurance market, and it kept people out, healthy people out, of the individual pools which would have stabilized the premiums. And so liberals and conservatives should have gotten together and scuttle it. Um, and I also wonder, where was the cry of ACA sabotage when, for whatever reason, the Obama administration refused to implement a statute that Congress had passed depriving the Treasury of needed revenue? And uh, there, I, I don't recall hearing too many cries about that. On the individual mandate, I agree with Chris that it was neutered. Um, and things like the inability of the IRS to actually enforce it in the same way that it enforces other mandates. What kind of nonsense is that? It's either a mandate that, that's like any other tax or it's not. Um, however, that nonsense was compounded for political reasons by the things like the existence of hardship exemptions for people who had gotten a utility shutoff notice. Okay, well, I think any of you in this room know just how to get a utility shutoff notice. It's not too hard to figure that out. Um, and you see, you, you, you see essentially a failure to acknowledge what the law said and a weakening of the law. And uh, so if I tend to agree, if states are going to impose their own individual mandates. They need to take it seriously. I would also say that if you were serious about an individual mandate, the amount was too low. Okay? If you really believe that the way that we uh, assure a stable individual insurance market is by not letting people play games, then you, you take that seriously and you set the price high enough that people are actually going to be induced. Now, there are substitutes for an individual mandate. There are things like, you know, you don't have to pay anything, but if you ever want back into the pool, then you've got to pay. And those were parts of the various Republican refor reform proposals that cratered this past couple of years. So uh, I will be interested to see how many states actually say we're taking this seriously, we actually believe in Obamacare, and we're going to impose an individual mandate, and how many will actually go further and say, we, we believe in Obamacare so much that we're not going to take the easy way out that the federal government did and actually have a serious individual mandate? Well, it seems like we want to have it both ways, which is not the first time that's happened in politics, the appearance of an individual mandate without the reality, and we run away from it. Let me just try to uh, give a, a small, since we had such vigorous opposition to the, uh, the, the Texas lawsuit, to think of a, a virtue in the midst of a, a, a modest remedy on that front. You know, we still have an individual mandate, we just don't have any penalties attached to it. 
Would a more narrow view of the Texas case, depending on how it unfolds, be to simply put the individual mandate out of its misery? I mean, we technically have a vestige of CBO scoring. Say it has a few effects, although they're, they're retreating from that. So if you simply say you can't have a rhetorical insistence that you buy insurance, even though there's no penalty, that you, you simply say that's unconstitutional, going back to the Roberts decision, and go home without taking apart everything else. I, I think that uh, repealing the individual mandate as it now exists, I mean, I think it has been repealed. I think one response to the Texas lawsuit is a, uh, a command without any form of enforcement is, uh, is, is nothing. Um, and uh, and so what's the problem? I they mean, found they, they, they found two plaintiffs who say they found two plaintiffs who say, "Gee, <laughs> we <laughs> never drive above seventy when Absolutely. we're in West Texas on the interstate. It's the law. That's all uh, it takes." And so they, and so they say, <laughs> "We're going to buy insurance because it says we have to," and well, that's kind of bullshit. Um, but anyway, the uh, the individual mandate. Yeah, I mean, at this point, as of 2019, it no longer exists. And also, I I really agree that. The penalty was way too low. There are too many exceptions. The Obama administration created too many exceptions. The Trump administration has created more. But the CBO still thinks that there's something there, um, that the yeah. repeal of the individual mandate as it exists now... A uh, trace element, we is, used to call this an environmental law. Yeah, is going to have an effect, and the insurers really believe it's going to have an effect, that, that they are going to have a higher cost risk pool and their costs are going up for next year, and I think most of them pretty much take seriously the CBO estimate that it's going to increase by 10 percent. So there was something there. Uh, at this point, I don't think there is as of 2019. On the employer mandate, just to say, um, it was a bad idea <laughs> to be, I mean, there was a good idea there, as Chris said, which is let's keep employers in, in, the, in the business. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever the merits of Seth's argument that, that they're doing a bad job, they should have never been there in the first place. I think at this point, trying to move everybody from the employer mandate, uh, employer market to the individual market um, in, in one fell swoop would be uh, a, a real disaster for the American health care system. Uh, it is a system that actually is working pretty well. Uh, for, uh, for at least for the consumers, for employees. Uh, but once they came up with this idea, then th th you had to figure out, well, okay, who's a large employer? Who's a small employer? At what point does a large employer become a small employer? Who's a full-time employee? Who's a part-time employee? How are we going to keep track of that? And they created this huge, uh, pro a huge uh, set of regulations that employers have to to comply with. And, you know, the, all of the proposals last summer would have repealed the employer mandate, but they wouldn't have impealed, repealed the reporting requirements because the reporting requirements cannot be touched under the Byrd Amendment. And that's the real problem with the employer mandate. The real problem isn't the people who have to pay. The real problem is figuring out whether you have to pay or not. Um, so I'm all in favor and have been for some time said this of repealing the employer mandate. I don't know why we can't get a bipartisan agreement on that. Um, I think that the employer system would continue to function just fine. People don't offer employer coverage because they have to. They do it because it's the only way you can get people to work for you in a, in a large business. Um, so uh, it seems to me that, but on the other hand, we're just shedding provisions left and yeah, right. Well, here. on the other hand, there have been several lawsuits challenging it, and they've all been thrown out under the Tax Injunction Act. So it's something Congress is going to have to do, and maybe this latest round of, of problems with the penalties is 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 going to be what it takes to get it done. All right, we're not giving enough credit. Tom, to Tom can I okay. jump well, in right, on right, this? Because yes, then, then I have to leave too. Yeah. So I totally agree with Tim on the employer mandate, uh, and I think most progressives, the Urban Institute did this some two years ago, saying basically we don't need it anymore. The reporting is more burdensome. I mean, the administrative side of this is more burdensome than it's worth. On the individual mandate, I'll start by saying that I want to be careful because this kind of certainty about where the ACA is headed, I think, has gotten a lot of us in trouble. Everybody's certain of their path for the ACA, and it's usually turned out to be something completely different than any, anybody expected. But I still do believe, as an insurance guy, that an individual market where you have guaranteed issue will not function very well 
if you don't also have a mandate. We haven't really come up with any good alternative. We do know that it can work. Massachusetts made it work at the state level. So I would hope that we see states really follow the Massachusetts example. Maybe New Jersey figures it out next, Vermont, California, and that as states figure it out, this will be the route to make Obamacare work is with a vigorous mandate, a stronger mandate as everybody has said. I think that's absolutely what you need to make it work. If we don't do that, I'm quite certain that what we'll see is continued deterioration of the pool. It's not going from 10 million people down to 250,000 people as a high risk pool. That's not going to happen, but it will continue to go down rather than up if you don't have that incentive for the individual to be in the risk pool. And you will clearly see many more alternative plans out there, you know, like the, that are trying to cut the margins here, like Idaho and uh, the, the short term plans and so forth. All of those pressures will be there. And the last thing you'll see is a lot more federal government money. And this is what concerns me. This is what the federal Solves government Solves everything. Had. We'll spend more money on re – you will have to have a kick-ass reinsurance program to make up for the mandate, and we ought to have a more disciplined, structured market. And if we don't figure this out, my last prediction is that we will then continue to toy with getting rid of the employer market in favor of single payer because th this part of the market will not function, and it will continue to be a political uh, problem. And, and it does work in, in uh, Germany and the, the Netherlands, so if we were Dutch or Germans, we could make it work. Well, I usually apply the, Ma the Las Vegas rule to any reference to Massachusetts, which whatever happens in Massachusetts should stay in Massachusetts. <laughs> but uh, we're going to switch to another uh, spawning ground. That Thank you, Joel. Appreciate you being here. Uh, spawning, we're going to go to your questions in about 15 minutes. Uh, a spawning ground of litigation, uh, whatever you want to call risk protection. I mean, money's just swapping hands. Someone has to get the hot potato and someone else has to get paid off. But we've certainly, uh, I need to give more credit to the co-ops, though even though they pretty much disappeared, they were a litigation breeding machine. I mean, those, you know, feisty characters, they may not have made any money, may not have covered anybody, but they could bring lawsuits. And they pretty much are responsible for what continues in terms of what remains of litigation and cost sharing reductions. They got a class action going on on that, I think. Uh, the risk adjustment came out of a uh, several uh, co-ops, because we also had the Massachusetts case, which went the other way, and, and efforts to somehow get paid even after death, I suppose. So, <laughs> To quickly make some, some, some sense of this, uh, we'll, we'll take it in, in sequence. We talked a little bit about risk adjustment. We'll come back to that in a second. We've got risk corridors kind of lingering almost at the end of that process. We've got cost sharing reductions, which it's a little hard to judge after the D.C. settlement as to what's going on in California. Are we going to have multiple rounds of this, or are we just the, the fading embers of an old fire? On the risk corridor litigation on which the Federal Court of Appeals has weighed in, it was a split decision. Uh, they are going to ask for en banc review. The, the profile of the panel as a whole is quite different from the panel that heard it. So I could see that going the other way. Um, and uh, that would be uh, the biggest <coughs> lawsuit, I think, that has ever been handled in the Court of Claims. Um, and there are there are 30 some lawsuits and a and a class action, including 150 some uh, insurers involved, and there are billions and billions and I think 12 billion dollars, something like that. I, I want. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, go on. Okay. But I do want to talk about the other two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let me talk about it's risk so corridors. Risk corridors for a moment, and let me just assume possibly that all of you in here are not ACA junkies, and so if I'm telling you something you already know, sorry. But let me just try and explain if people don't understand what the risk corridors litigation is about. The ACA had a provision in it which basically specified that if after all was said and done, you may, an insurer made over a certain amount of money during the first three years of the program, that insurer would basically have a claim against a pot of, I'm sorry, if they made a lot of money, they would owe money to a pot of mo a fund. Whereas if after all was said and done, that insurer lost money, they would have a claim against that pot of money. Okay? So I think there was an optimistic belief that it would equal out 
and therefore the amount of claims would equal the amount that went in, and everyone would be okay. As it turned out, um, the insurers by and large lost, and lost massively. So for example, in 2016, $21 million was paid in, and there were claims of $3.5 billion against it. Okay, so the issue is, does anyone have to make up that difference, like the federal government, or is it just basically like claiming against a bankrupt and you get, you know, two cents on the dollar and that's sorry. So the, the losing insurers, the ones who had those $3.5 billion in claims and more, have sued and basically said this is an obligation of the federal government. After all, the statute says you shall pay. And the response of the federal government has been there's a difference in law between a promise to pay and an actual appropriation. And the Constitution requires that Congress appropriate money, which here pretty clearly, and we might debate that, it never did. Um, I personally have always thought this is a very hard case, and I have studiously, I think, avoided taking a strong stance on the merits of that. I could see it going on bonk. I could actually see the Supreme Court taking this on cert because there are important, put aside the ACA, there's actually an even bigger issue, which is the stability of government contracts. How does the government, how does one Congress bind private bodies to come in and help with a government program if that private entity has to always worry, well, maybe a subsequent Congress won't fund it. On the other hand, shouldn't a subsequent Congress be able to say, wait a second, we don't actually have the money to pay for that this year. We have different priorities. And so we're not actually going to pay for it. And you, you have to understand that going in private contractor. So I think it's a, actually a quite difficult case. And I, I don't know which way it will ultimately come out. But I'm not sure that we're done with risk corridors. Let me just try to transition because the appellate decision, at least in the two to one decision, seemed to suggest in this case, Congress spoke pretty clearly, although the, the dissent said otherwise. Now, in this case, they actually had the appropriation rider and said we're, we're cutting off the funding. In the cost sharing reduction, it was more that there was never an appropriation there, it was almost silence. Does that suggest when these cost sharing reduction cases run up through the, the, the federal claims process? that they maybe have a harder way to go because, in fact, Congress was less explicit despite the House Burwell precedent, which is not a precedent anymore. Yeah. The, go, ahead. go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, I, I almost think the argument for the risk corridor payments, which says, you know, the government should, should pay us the money, the, it, that argument, I think, carries greater weight in the cost-sharing yeah. side of the world based on the statute mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you ensure if you're offering an exchange plan, you know, you must reduce the out-of-pocket costs. And the money mandating as Correct. The uh, so, so speaking to the risk order for a moment, and maybe speaking to the three R's, the reinsurance, risk order, and risk adjustment, to an extent they all were zero-sum games. And, you know, the recent decision talks about budget neutrality. I mean, granted – when we were developing these three R's, it was more the actuaries that were telling us how to do it as opposed to us thinking through the policy of it. But we always envisioned these to be zero-sum games, kind of budget neutral, that they would pay for themselves. And when it came to reinsurance, for example, compared to risk corridor and risk adjustment, which did not have a congressional appropriations to pay for those programs, in reinsurance we said, well, we need some pot of money to fund reinsurance. And so what we did is we tapped employers uh, sponsoring self-insured plans to pay in, as well as insurance carriers to pay in. So there was a pot of money for reinsurance. Then they paid where, insurers yeah, first yeah, yeah. in front of the Treasury. Yes. We'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. Where there was not in the context of the other risk adjustment and risk order. And I think that speaks volumes when it comes to this litigation and, and whether 
those carriers who rely to their detriment on getting paid and them not getting paid, I think they're out of luck, in my opinion. Okay, we're, we're almost tapped out on risk cars just for short time. But Tim, can you give us a sense as to cost sharing reduction? We got multiple lawsuits. Is stuff still lingering around in California? What moves next on on, on that front? Well, I think the California lawsuit. Um, I don't know what they do next because yeah. I thought that the judge's uh, decision in denying the preliminary injunction, right. saying, uh, "Hey, who's been harmed here?" Uh, is they're going to have a loading, hard time yeah. arguing with that as long as they can do the silver loading, which is to say that they shift all the costs to the federal government anyway, just through the back door instead we of do the front door. We do that all the time. Right. Um, on the other hand, I keep hearing rumors that the Trump administration is going to cut off silver loading, and at that point I think this becomes a, 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 a very big issue and, and that litigation may succeed. In terms of the separate litigation brought by the private insurers, on the cost sharing reductions, at least for the last few months in 2017 when they were sort of left high and dry and got nothing. I, I think Chris has a good point. On on the risk adjustment, which was the big news over the weekend. Risk adjustment makes my head hurt. <laughs> I agree uh, with Seth's analysis of it, which is that uh, this New Mexico decision is completely crazy. And uh, it I'm I'm troubled by the Trump administration saying we're not going to do any, we're not going to pay anybody anything um, until we get this this litigation sorted out. It seems to me that they should just issue an interim final rule saying re re reissuing the 2017 and 2018 rules with the response to the court that they included in the 2019 rule, which sorts everything out and just say, okay, you vacated that rule. Here's the same rule. Here's our justification. Let's go. Um, but in the meantime, this morning, they issued all of, the all of the figures that the insurers actually need for moving forward, which was the real problem. The insurers needed to know what they could book and, and, and what they couldn't and what they owed and what they were going to get. And they have that information now. They wouldn't have been paid until November anyway. So I think that this is kind of a, a, a big fuss over very little. All right. Let me switch to a quick area before we go to your questions. I'll use it in the catch-all of escape pods uh, from the mothership. Uh, we had this both through regulatory uh, proposed rules. Some have actually been put out as final rules and also waivers. Whether it's association health plans is one way around the collectivizing of what the rules are, the short-term limited duration plans, which will drop shortly, uh, and, and variations of Medicaid waivers is almost a like political means for perhaps some folks who are uncomfortable with the Medicaid expansion to have at least a rationale for taking the money and, and running. Are these just regulatory variations within the scope of, well, we're just adjusting in order to get to where you're putting people in a box they don't want to stay in, or has something been transgressed in the way in which this has occurred contrary to the statute? I think it's the all. former. I think it's the we're in a box that we can't get out of and folks are – arguably suffering as a result of that, so we need to provide them with additional alternatives. You can argue about the merits of the alternatives that are being offered, but I think that's the core of it is, look, Congress in the political environment that we now live in is, is unable to fix the ACA, unable to. And as a result, there's this box that's or this rock that's immovable, so we need to come up with these alternatives. Um, I'll also just digress to say, I don't think the Trump administration will cancel silver loading. I do not think that they will do that. I, I, I definitely don't. So I want to put that on the record. But back to the alternatives, um, again, you're just seeing the individual market, and this goes back to when we were drafting the law, we, we knew the individual market was dysfunctional. We, we figured, we, we viewed the small group market as being dysfunctional as well. So we changed the rules in and around those two markets in, in hopes that we would create functional markets. And they just created another dysfunctional one. That's for, not bad. Yeah, for, for right or wrong, and there's many reasons why those markets remain dysfunctional, the fact of the matter is they remain dysfunctional, and that's why you see the alternatives. Sure. So let me again, and, and if, if you all know this, great. Um, let me explain what the short-term limited duration fight is about. Um, Right now, under the ACA, basically, if you offer a standard ACA-type individual policy, the insurer cannot engage in medical underwriting. They can't say, you are unhealthy, we're going to charge you three times as much as we would charge a healthy person, and that has pros and cons. What these 
and the Obama administration, there were these things out there called short-term limited duration policies, where if you needed a health insurance policy to tide you over between jobs for 63 days or more, you could go get it. As long as you were healthy, you could get one of these policies, but because these weren't thought to be ACA policies, the insurer could underwrite as it did in the bad old days before the ACA. So if you permit that too much, it becomes a vehicle for subverting the ACA. Everybody who's healthy goes out and keeps getting short-term policies, whereas people who aren't healthy and can't get them remain in the ACA pool. The price of ACA policies goes up, which drives others out. The price of ACA policies goes up more, and you get into a bad cycle. So the Obama administration dealt with that by placing limits on what these short-term duration plans could be even beyond what the states had done. What the Trump administration is basically proposing. They did that rather late, though. They lived with it for quite a while. Yes, they did, and Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there was that much – I don't think the subversion was quite there yet. But what we have now is the Trump administration has essentially lifted those restrictions, and so – As an insurer, I can go out and sell you a policy for 364 days, and I can say, I'll take you if you're healthy, but if you're not, forget about it, okay? So what can happen, therefore, and they will advertise these, and there are some of the big insurers who are enthusiastic about these, is that will tend to to separate the HCA pool, and it will be left even more so, particularly with the absence of an individual mandate and a bunch of other things, as ever more a kind of higher risk pool, maybe not a high risk pool, but certainly a higher risk pool, which will drive up the cost of subsidies and make it yet more difficult for people who earn more than 400% of the federal poverty level to afford one of these policies. And so this is what the fight about short-term policies is about. If you are healthy, it now provides an escape from Obamacare And you will likely be able to get a policy for a half of what you would have to pay on the exchange, maybe even less than a half. On the other hand, and if you are unhealthy but earn less than 400% of the federal poverty level, you may also be okay because the federal government subsidies are just going to go up. The person this hurts are the people who earn more than 400% of FBL or are otherwise ineligible for subsidies and have some pre-existing condition which makes them unattractive to one of these short-term plan insurers. And that is what this fight is about. And this is a, a you know, a big deal. So uh, someone's going to go unhappy unless we subsidize everyone up the wazoo, right? Well, we have done that for years for everybody except for the uninsured and the individual and market. different winners and losers. Yeah, well, and so when, now we're finally catching up. Okay. On the short term, just to say um, – there's a long history here, and I won't work through it, but um, it's, it is, I think, the unsubsidized in the individual market who have pre-existing conditions who are going to see their rates, well, are seeing their rates climbing uh, with the presumed uh, soon-to-be-announced legalization of 364-day short-term plans. And let me also say, I think the idea of not having health insurance on New Year's Eve is not a good idea, but uh, that's where we're going. Uh, but, but also, um, these are terrible policies. I mean, they have pages of exclusions. One of the most common exclusions is, is any injuries in interscholastic sports or in preparation for interscholastic sports. Now, what's the one thing that a healthy young family probably wants coverage for? Um, anyway, uh, so I think that uh, not only is it going to hurt the risk pool, it's also going to, there's also going to be a lot of problems with these things. There's a lot of... There's a long history here. There's a lot of lawsuits on on uh, post claims underwriting, on rescissions in these policies, um, and I think that it's it's not it's the consumers who think that this is a great deal who are probably going to have some of the biggest problems with them. Um, it, it, I th- I think that they're illegal. I think that the that the whole that the 364 day policy, which was approved under under HIPAA when the regs approved under, under HIPAA, where it didn't really make any difference. If long-term is a year, is 364 days short-term? I mean, I think the idea here was let's cover the gap. Um, Short gaps between employment, short gaps uh, between coverage of other sorts. 
and what we end and what we ended up up until 2016, and it really didn't matter until 2014 when all the individual market rules kicked in. But what we ended in 2016, they said, well, let's 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 cut it from from 12 months to three months, and I think that's where it should stay. But I and there will be lawsuits, but I don't know how successful they're going to be because it's a little bit of a hard argument. On associations, um, I think that. We're going to see lawsuits there in New York and Massachusetts have already said they're going to file lawsuits. Um, I think that there are some good arguments under uh, ERISA and under uh, the ACA uh, about some of the provisions there, but I think the main provision that bothers me is the working owner provision uh, where um, the Department of Labor says it's going to change very long-standing policy that uh, you can't be a small group unless you employ somebody other than yourself uh, and now say you can be a small group of one. You can be an employer, an employee, and a group health plan with a fiduciary relationship to yourself. I think that's nonsense, and I think the courts may hold that, and I think that's where the challenge will be. Um, and again, I think we're undermining the, the individual and small group markets, but, um, but uh, Chris argues very cogently that this is a good alternative for a lot of small groups, and, and maybe it will be. Well, there's one bright ray of hope for the legal community, which is there are lawsuits ahead, so we can look oh, forward yeah. to that. Uh, yeah. Businesses continue to boom, uh, even if it is a little champion. Unfortunately, I never get paid for any of them. That's these. correct. Can I have uh, another well, I want to see if we have any. We're just right. going to run short on time. I want to go to the audience with some questions. I have some in reserve as well, but if you could just uh, identify yourself and uh, don't file an entire brief, uh, but just ask sure. your question, please. Uh, Bill Arnone with the National Academy of Social Insurance. Uh, in the category of hindsight is 2020, which politically is a very ironic uh, term these days. Uh, if, knowing everything you now know, if you could go back and advise the Obama administration to do one thing differently, that would have made a difference, what would it be? For example, should Medicare, instead of Medicaid, been the vehicle for expansion in the, on the exchanges? I, I would say uh, rely on the private sector when it, came, when it comes to enrollment in the individual market through the exchanges. That, that would be my recommendation. So I wouldn't recommend the Medicare, Medicaid, as, as you mentioned. That would be my one. I mean, there's obviously a myriad that we could choose from, but that would be my one. I think if we're talking about the statute, um, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. If we're talking about implementation, I think the biggest mistake that the Obama administration made was, uh, number one, not clarifying what was meant by if you like what you have, you can keep it, which means in March of 2010, not in December of 2013. And... The, 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 the decision to allow the grandmother to transitional plans was an absolute disaster for the market. Uh, it was completely unfair to the insurers who had not seen it coming and uh, was a really, really bad decision. Uh, uh, politically, maybe it was a good decision. Maybe it kept things from getting worse in the 2013 elections, but it, it was not a good decision for the market. Passing alone, implementing it, two different things. Seth? Yeah. Hard question. I'm going to go with be honest about what the darn thing is going to really cost. There was such nonsense being spouted about how little this was all going to cost. And I think that we need to confront the fact that providing health insurance to large segments of the population that don't have it before and coupling that with American-style health care is a very expensive proposition. And instead, what you had was nonsense, such as $70 billion of the bill being paid for by the Class Act, yeah, which was never, ever going to get off the ground. It served any its purpose, though. Yes, because it enabled you to count $70 billion of money that didn't actually exist. And so perhaps that's not highest on people's radar, and it's something that only academics focus on. But... I think if there had been an honest assessment of what it all would cost, I have this perhaps naive thought that it might have been architected a little better. Uh, be a naive thought that it could be passed, but again, uh, the contortions, a lot of what we're doing is you have to make it look one way to pass it, and then you deal with the residue later on. Yeah. Question in the back. Hi. Uh, 
Paul Heldman and Heldman Simpson Partners. Um, so just on the risk adjusters, I think your panel is pretty clear. As Tim said, big fuss about very little. But if I could pin you down, do you think, uh, what do you think the likelihood that there are, the payouts happen before year end? Um, and is there any chance that the formula changes? Because the underlying argument in New Mexico was that the big insurers were, getting, were doing much better than they should and the small insurers were getting screwed. And then just there, on another issue, there have been subtle regulatory changes in the essential health benefits package. How do you think that might change the benefits offerings um, um, on the exchanges? On the risk adjustment, I think that there's a 100% chance that the payout will come when it would have otherwise come in the fall, unless the Trump administration decides that this is a, a good way to throw a wrench into the whole thing. But there's no reason why they can't either get this resolved, I think, or put out an inter interim final rule if, if they have the will to do it. Um, the the, this, the uh, risk adjustment formula was changed in 2017 pretty significantly, and in the report that's out for 2017, which would have been the Obama administration's last payment rule, and in the report that came out this morning, they note that, that the transfers are going to be smaller, and I think that a number of those changes were favorable to the smaller plans, although, as, as Tom noted, uh, many of the smaller plans are not around anymore. Um, on the essential... Just their lawyers are. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a lot of the, I mean, those are gar state guarantee funds that pick that up. So That's right. right. <laughs> Some of those are insurance commissioners who are trying to get their money back. Um, the, on, on the essential health benefits, uh, I don't, th 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 that authorized the states to change them for 2020. And I have not heard of much action there. I think Chris's analysis was spot on that, that states are not really wanting less generous packages uh, and are not really eager to take on their disease associations to fight for getting rid of their autism mandates or their, their uh, uh, mastectomy reconstruction mandates. So um, I, there, there'll probably be some action in some states. I mean, uh, Commissioner Cameron in Idaho would like to change some of their things, but, but I don't think there's gonna be much. Let me say I agree with uh, Tim. If you look at one of my slides, I have a slide that says things that I don't think are major issues for fate of the ACA, and one of them is essential health benefits package changes. On the risk adjustment, I am not going to go to 100% that they're going to get paid by the end of the year. Um, I think it's more likely than not that they will be paid because I think, the, as we seem to all agree, at least in, on this panel, the New Mexico judge's decision is quite vulnerable um, and that the problem can be cured and there will be some pressure. With respect to changes in the formula, you'll note that one of the things that the Trump administration did was to permit the states to cut the amount yeah. that would be transferred yeah. through the system by up to 50%. Yeah. And I think that's a very good decision by the Trump administration. The Risk adjustment is lovely in theory, but it creates a big problem in multi-insurance states, which is that right, without risk adjustment as an insurer, your basic problem is figuring out how risky is my pool going to be and what do I have to price my policies out to meet those obligations. With substantial risk adjustment, you not only have to calculate how risky your pool is going to be, but how risky relative to other insurers in the state your pool is going to be. And if as a large insurer, you get that wrong by a little bit, it's not such a big deal. As a small insurer, if you get that wrong, as many of these co-ops found out, you can be absolutely devastated by the amount of risk adjustment obligations you have. And therefore, I think one of the several mistakes the Obama administration made in usurping the authority of the states and implementing risk adjustment on a unitary basis on its own was to uh, permit huge amounts of money to be transferred th through that system based on formulae for which they honestly did not have great justification. The New Mexico judge may also have gotten wrong the other parts of his decision where he upheld the other parts of the risk adjustment regulations. But uh, I believe that the changes that the Trump administration have made here are actually good ones 
and conceivably might help more small insurers venture into the ACA market. Yeah. I don't want to talk in absolutes, but I think this administration is looking out for the new entrant to the market, the startups, the Oscars of the world, and they buy the argument that risk adjustment in the formula is tilted, and therefore they're taking steps to rectify that, to help the startups and to help the new entrants to the market. And we see that in the 2019 Notice of Benefit of Payment Parameters, where it allows the states to reduce the payments and the charges by 50%, because who does that help? That helps the folks that we're paying in. And who are the folks that we're paying in? The startups and the new entrants to the market. And if, I think the, the, the looking out for the startups and the new entrants is also reflected in this recent risk adjustment decision to hold the payments and to almost side with a court case, which we all agree is vulnerable. Um, and, and I do think, though, that payments will be made at some point. This issue will be resolved. Essential health benefits, you know, you have to remember that the regs say you can't go below the 10 services that I mentioned. And it is unlikely to what I said and to what Tim just uh, affirmed, I think the states are, uh, are unlikely to go below the 10, below to where they currently are. I just don't see much movement there. Right, let me just wrap up with one uh, two-part uh, whirlwind uh, through the panel for your parting thoughts. One is, uh, you know, we've uh, been, been trumpeting the, uh, the many mysteries of litigation. Litigation takes a long time. It doesn't really give you the results you want. It's all over the place. Suddenly, three years later, you're somewhere else. So the litigation approach as opposed to the, oh, shut up and just deal with the regulation approach. What are, what are the trade-offs on that? The other part is the general tenor of the panel is, you know, the Trump administration hasn't been that crazy on regulation. Uh, do you have any exceptions to that? Or do you say, like, you know, we, most of what we've been talking about is in the past saying, well, they kind of stretched the corners early on in Obama because of a difficult political pressures. But now we've somewhat settled into a more stable regulatory mode. Is that a conclusion we should take out of this? Less regulation, more reasonable, uh, or less litigation, more reasonable regulation? Or are we going to do this against, uh, cater to our base instincts anyway? My, my comment is I think this administration is, is implementing the law, HHS, that they believe that is their job, and I believe the regulations that have come out or the sub-regulatory guidance or interpretation of the law uh, under this administration has been fairly reasonable. Um, when it comes to the alternatives, when it comes to litigation, let me say that, I don't see the litigation relating to the regulatory decisions, at least relating to ACA regulatory decisions. The litigation will crop up in the, these alternatives, and I'll offer this and throw this out uh, to, or to pass the baton, is there are also regulations that will be coming out shortly, and those proposed rules will allow employers to give a tax-free contribution to an employee to purchase an individual market plan. So query how those regs, which are intended to, again, be another alternative to the box or the rock, which is the individual market, which can't be moved, does that help those individuals in the unsubsidized market, for example, or does that help those employers in the small group market who are facing high costs in providing coverage to their employees and instead they're like, well, look, I'll get out of the healthcare game, but I'll remain a financier, give them a contribution. But that success of this HRA type of approach where you put money into a reimbursement account, pays for it on a tax-free basis, is contingent on the individual market being a functional market. So I would suggest you get rid of the small group market entirely. You allow small employers to go to an AHP or you allow small employers to discontinue their group plan but keep their money in the game, and you put those people into the individual market, and that flowing of those folks into the individual market could help the risk pool in the individual market, and you help those folks in the current small group market by giving them the choice between an AHP market or uh, uh, a subsidized individual market plan, i.e. employer subsidized tax-free individual market plan. I know that's a little out there, but it's something okay. that I think should be discussed. Tim, litigation, regulation, they've both been good to you for uh, professional <laughs> business, but what, what's your assessment? I haven't made any money, well, very little money off of them. Um, the, on the litigation, I mean, what happened there was that uh, as the day the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, there were lawsuits filed. And those lawsuits were, I, I mean, 
they did have an argument. In fact, on one of their arguments, they succeeded in the Supreme Court. Virtually all the rest of the cases were thrown out on standing or on various procedural reasons or sometimes on the merits. But they were very important for delegitimizing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the const constant argument, the whole thing is unconstitutional, it's being uh, implemented in violation of the, of the law, uh, and those points were, um, I think, very persuasive with a lot of people. Now we're seeing the opposite. Uh, California, New York, and others are constantly filing lawsuits challenging the Trump administration. Everything they do is going to be challenged, and it's tit for tat, and I think it is also, again, going to play the same role, de delegitimizing the, the, the actions of the Trump administration, and that's the goal. So in terms of winning lawsuits, there have been few that have been won, but I think they have played an important political role. With respect to the decisions of the Trump administration, as I said, I think they have mostly tried to stretch the law rather than break the law. I think there are a couple of things like the extension of, uh, of uh, association health plans to individuals where they have gone beyond the law and, and lawsuits may be successful. The most outrageous thing the Trump administration has done so far, however, was uh, the filing that they made in the Texas case where they said, we agree that the individual mandate is now unconstitutional and therefore we think that the individual market should be destroyed by getting rid of guaranteed issue and community rating. That was a decision not of the attorneys handling the case. All uh, three of the, or three of the, uh, the career attorneys withdrew from the case when that decision was made. The brief was obviously written the last day because it's so sloppy and poorly thought out and poorly worded. Um, and the main attorney representing the government throughout the whole uh, Obamacare litigation history resigned from the Department of Justice the next day, uh, very soon thereafter, a very senior attorney. So I think that's the worst decision they've made, but it wasn't a regulatory decision, it was a litigation decision. Well, they're able to copy some of the arguments of the uh, justice brief in the Supreme Court, but I understand your argument in terms of where they are right now. Yeah. We'll let that one slide for a moment. Uh, Seth? I have to say, I kind of uh, find myself agreeing with Tim more than usual. Uh, <laughs> You'll I, get over it. <laughs> I, um, I have a hard time with the refusal to defend the constitutionality of the ACA based on setting the individual mandate to zero. As I said before, I just don't think that argument has much, if any, merit to it. Um, on tit for tat, um, I think it's fair to say the Obama administration also engaged in regulatory shenanigans ranging from failure to enforce the employer mandate to the $5 billion that was deprived of the United States Treasury and shoveled to insurance companies illegally um, and in other ways. Um, so I think I'm not saying it's even and one side justifies another, but I don't think that there are particularly saints or demons here. On litigation as a route, I actually, at some risk, I'm going to link this up with the immigration debate. Um, Justice Clarence Thomas in Trump versus Hawaii issued a very interesting concurring opinion in which he said, you know, we have single judges issuing injunctions barring nationwide programs. That's a relatively new phenomenon where a single judge can bring the government, at least the executive branch, to a halt. That's troubling. And I think, although he, he might have been wrong on the merits of the dispute, and I'm not a big fan at all of what Trump is doing on immigration, on this general point of individual judges being able to basically veto congressional and executive determinations without having review by, for example, a three-judge court, which used to exist more frequently, or the ability to get swifter appeals, I think it is problematic, both in the Hawaii context and in the context here of the New Mexico judge, just basically deciding to throw a giant monkey wrench into a, a payment of provision based on what I think most people would agree is pretty specious reasoning. And so I'm wondering if we're not going to see a push 
tour by Congress to some restrictions on the ability of the federal courts or even state courts to do this without better procedures where you would have a three-judge panel or the ability to take immediate appeals. Uh, and so I might think that that might be part of the big picture coming out of the litigation on the ACA is to me there's a serious question about the amount of power held by individual judges. Thank you, Seth. And uh, as I said at the start, I can't necessarily promise you same time next year, but it is never over till it's over, and it doesn't look like it's over yet. We appreciate your attention today, and we look forward to uh, having you here again. Bye. Good to meet you, sir. Thank you.